So, um, it gives me a great pleasure to, uh, and honor to be able to introduce our first plenary speaker, Dr. David Ansel. Uh, first of all, I have to address you uh, in honor of Gus White, like he always addresses people when he first steps up, and I neglected to do that, and that's my fellow humans. And he does that, and I've always uh, hesitated to do that, uh, probably because uh, I'm a, a little bit, uh, I don't know why I'm hesitant to do it. It's uh, because it's, it just doesn't come as comfortable as it is to him. But I uh, decided to do that this morning, and I forgot. So I'm sorry, Gus. <laughs> I won't do it again, sir. Yes, sir. So anyway, um, so uh, David Ansel, he's a Chicago-based physician. He's a social epidemiologist, and he's also an author. His efforts at both the national and local uh, levels have advanced concerns about health inequities and the structural and the structure of the U.S. healthcare system. His years as a provider to the medically underserved have made him a vocal supporter of single-payer health care. His 17 years at Cook County Hospital inspired him to write a memoir in social history entitled County, Life, Death, and Politics in Chicago's Public Health Care System. This is a photo of the cover of the book with Julia Keller in the Chicago Tribune entitled it as a landmark uh, book, which pointed out the social inequities uh, and resultant health care disparities that we find. In the mid-1980s, uh, he helped expose and criticize patient uh, you, uh, uh, Alex, you said I could read that thing that back here, but you know. <laughs> patient dumping, <laughs> and so from 2000, and then from 2000 to 2005, he worked on uh, uh, the, to, uh, uh, to, worked on the, uh, the aspect of, of uh, individuals with, uh, particularly with uh, 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 breast cancer, uh, mortality rates, and how they, they were affected. Um, also, between 2005 to 2015, he was the CMO at Rush University Medical Center, uh, and then in 2015 became the senior VP of Rush University Medical Center uh, Systems and Systems and Integration. Um, he's going to speak uh, speak to us uh, uh, about structural violence, uh, which is a term used to. Uh, describe the social arrangements that put individuals and populations um, and like he just told me he said I'm gonna start at the top of the mountain he said if I if I describe it um, and then from there it's gonna go he said his his speech is gonna be going downhill not downhill but down the mountain and uh, I think it's going to get tougher and tougher as we go down the mountain as he uh, fulfills all the rest of the descriptions about the structural things that, that make up uh, this and then the violent uh, component to, uh, to it. So with that, uh, he, his work continues. He's going to come out with his second book, which is The Death Gap and How Inequity Kills. So Dr. David Ansel. Thank you, and good morning, everybody. Good morning. And then a little better. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful day in Washington, D.C., and I'm pleased to be here with you. Um, my talk is uh, really about how inequality kills and I, doctors, hospitals, in the American death gap. 
You know, sometimes our words, I don't think our words quite describe what's going on. We call about, we use the word disparity, but actually, uh, and there are gaps in uh, morbidity and certainly uh, many things, but we're, what I'm talking about here is gaps in, in mortality, like who lives and dies and why. Uh, and just to start off, uh, I'm not an orthopedic surgeon, so I have nothing to disclose. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, that's, uh, but uh, that's me in front of the old Cook County Hospital, where it's kind of where everything I learned about what's right and wrong about healthcare in America uh, was at that, uh, that hospital. But I'm gonna talk in uh, th three parts here. And by the way, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, my mother uh, would have been very happy with that, I think, but uh, so, and, First part is I'm going to talk about Windora Cooper, a patient I've had since my early days at Cook County Hospital. In part two is I'm going to talk about structural violence and the American death gap. And the third part is really about Observe Judge Act. What do we do? Uh, and why I'm optimistic. Uh, and uh, when sometimes you wake up in the morning and wonder, should you, is there, is there a place for optimism? There's always a place for optimism. So this is Windora as uh, a young woman. So Windora uh, grew up in Alabama, moved with her family to Chicago uh, in the late 60s. She came from Birmingham uh, area and moved to the west side of Chicago. First uh, lived in Cabrini Green, a housing project uh, that people may have heard of uh, in days past. They've all been knocked down, but uh, now lives in a uh, region of Chicago called Humboldt Park. She's been my patient since my early days as a resident uh, at Cook County Hospital. And when I first saw her, uh, like many of my patients, she was, uh, had some obesity, mild uh, diabetes and hypertension, but all uh, within manageable range. I'm going to talk more about her uh, in a little bit. And there's uh, uh, me uh, with my medical school friends. We, uh, I'm that like hairy one right in the middle there. But, uh, <laughs> we, but actually, all of us, uh, this group, we met in medical school. And we really struggled about the profession when we came in. Because we came in saying, we really want to do good things in the world. And then we discovered uh, the U.S. healthcare system, and we studied it. And I was very demoralized that first year of medical school, and I was so demoralized, I went to uh, SUNY Upstate in Syracuse, New York, and they had a uh, great uh, forestry school, and I was an outdoorsman, and I said, oh, well, maybe medicine isn't for me, and I thought of becoming a forest ranger. And I actually got an application to the forestry school to say, I'm going to get out of this. This is not what I thought it was going to be. But a group of us sat together, and we studied the US healthcare system. And I walked back from the edge of the woods, uh, <laughs> figuratively uh, speaking, because I discovered you know, what I, we all had in common is what we wanted to do. We wanted to be doctors. But what wasn't clear is why we were doing it. And through that study and through uh, our observations in medical school, we came up with that, oh, this is why we're doing it, because healthcare is a human right. And uh, this is actually one of the unsolved uh, uh, dilemmas in the United States and America, that this was my belief and the belief of my friends that healthcare is a human right, but, it's, but the embodiment of rights uh, in this is not uh, accepted widely yet or widely enough uh, to get us to where we can actually deliver equity. But we knew, and actually I get up every morning and I do what I do, and it doesn't matter what the job it is, is that healthcare is a human right. Healthcare is a human right. And then what more can I do today and with others? That's why I came uh, here uh, to promote this idea, which is not a radical idea, by the way. Uh, it's just not accepted uh, in, this, in this country. And it will be. And when we get there, uh, I, will, uh, I will rest. 
That actually took us to Cook County Hospital because we decided that we wanted to go to the, where the, this idea that healthcare wasn't a human right was being played out day in and day out. And it's not just at Cook County Hospital. There are places all around the country. This just happened to be the place where we decided to go. And for those doctors in the room, how many doctors here, physicians? So it's fourth year medical students. Uh, you know, you, there's a match. And you list all the places that you want to go, and it goes through the computer. Well, we decided we wanted to go to the same place together. So we just put one place on our match list, Cook County Hospital. And our, and our professors thought we were doing, uh, it was career suicide. Uh, because the place had been discredited three years before. The doctors had gone out on strike. The residents had gone out on strike for patient care conditions. It was the longest, it still is the longest doctor strike in US uh, history. Uh, the strike leaders, they won the strike and the strike leaders were thrown into Cook County Jail. Uh, and actually the guy, uh, Jack Raba, who uh, led the strike was a former seminarian. And um, he tells the story of being in Cook County Jail and it was Thanksgiving. And uh, the doctors didn't show up to see the, uh, for the clinic at, the, uh, at Cermak Jail, so they let him out of his cell and he saw patients. And uh, not thinking afterwards, like he would do after a shift, he walked out of the jail. <laughs> and he thought, I could just hitchhike to my parents' house for Thanksgiving, which was not that far away. But he realized if he did that, escape from jail is a felony. He was in for defying a back to court order that was a misdemeanor. So he knocked on the jail door to get back in. Uh, Jack. Jack subsequently became the medical director, ironically, of that uh, jail health services. And you could say about Jack, he knew the place inside and out. <laughs> but the other thing Jack did as medical director, I don't know if people ever follow the, uh, the news from Chicago, but uh, a, a, a prisoner was brought in uh, with burns all over his body. A doctor who was seeing this prisoner called him Jack up and said, I think this patient's been tortured. And it was that observation, doctor's observation in a jail of a patient been tortured by the Chicago police that led to the uncovering of this police commander, John Burge, on the south side of Chicago. Uh, his torturing of uh, literally hundreds of people into false confessions and the end of the death penalty in the state of Illinois. So Jack Raba was just a, is a great man, but uh, that's the kind of people you met at Cook County Hospital. My parents were immigrants from England, and I like to say my, a little bit of my social justice uh, position and why we must stay active is because my mother's family was wiped out in the Holocaust. But when I was at Cook County Hospital, the BBC decided to come to Cook County to do a talk, to do a show, to show the Brits what healthcare in America was like. And I saw patients after patients being rolled into the emergency room on these ambulances, and they asked the doctor, uh, uh, Dr. Linda Ray Murray, who subsequently became president of the American Public Health Association, but she was a resident. How do you describe this to the British people? What's going on? And she said, well, I don't know what you call it, but I call it murder. And that became the name of the documentary. And my relatives started calling my mother and said, is David all right? Because he's at this uh, Cook County Hospital. But I actually think it was prescient uh, because I'm here I am many years later talking about the death gap. And uh, it was these observations of, of conditions uh, and the study of these things that lead us to you know, inescapable conclusions. Then you got to decide what to do. So in those days, you know, the hospital was going to close. I call this doctors within borders because we saw our patients in the morning and then we had to demonstrate for the hospital to keep it open because there were fights for keeping public hospitals uh, open there. And, uh, but it wasn't enough just to walk into any place and just uh, accept conditions, the status quo as it is. You know, the place needed to be improved. And actually, that's how I got to be a chief medical officer. You look around, things aren't, aren't working. So, well, who's going to fix it? Well, that's, how, that's quality improvement. A lot of my work has been around just taking principles of improvement and quality and applying them to things like inequity. Because I, it, I really, most of inequity is a gaps in quality, really, when you get right down to it, whether it be access or how we deliver care in an equitable way, uh, who gets what and why. 
But we decided we would take on a problem. So it was this problem of patients uh, being transferred. So it was actually from the beginning of time in this country, if you don't have insurance, there are many uh, people who won't see you. It's true in practice today. In fact, in front of orthopedic surgeons, I love, uh, we have the best, among the best orthopedic surgeon group, surgery group at Rush. We have God's gift to orthopedics, at least in the Midwest. But if you don't have the right card, they won't see you. I can tell you our uh, orthopedic surgeons go to on global uh, mission trips with us. We have a wonderful global health program. And we'll do orthopedic surgery on the uninsured in uh, uh, Haiti and in the Dominican Republic, but not in Chicago. OK, and that's just fact. And it's not just fact in Chicago. It's fact across the country. Uh, but hospitals used to do this as well. Hospitals would say, if you came to a hospital, you didn't have the right card, we're going to send you out. We're not going to treat you. And that was common practice all across the country. And Cook County went from 100 a month to 600 a month. A couple of guys, we got together and said, well, you know, someone should do something about it. That's how it starts. Someone should do something about that. And we looked around and said, well, why don't we try to do it? And we had no idea what we were doing. But we decided that we would do a study. This is from the Sun-Times in that area, a dump truck with patients. And we just decided we would track 500 patients. None of us had ever done a study. I never thought about staying in academic medicine. It was never a thought, never done research, didn't even know how to add two numbers together. But we just tracked 500 patients. We went and found who came in the emergency room. We just uh, did an analysis of who was stable and unstable. We looked to say, did you, get inf you know, did you get informed consent? You know, the way that it worked, the phone rang in the emergency room of Cook County. You look around, no one's there. You go pick it up. There's a clipboard next to the phone. And if someone said, we want to transfer a patient, there was a piece of paper, name, uh, date of birth, diagnosis, reason for transfer. And what do you think the reason for transfer was almost 100% of the time? No insurance. But when we went to talk to the patients, what do you think the patients said, the reason they were told there was? Because uh, this is a, a big insight. This is not about bad people. It's about bad systems. So imagine you're the resident on the other side of the line, and the, um, the administrator of this institution and your department chair has told you, we can't take patients who have this, that don't have insurance. So when someone comes in our institution, your job is to put, call up and transfer them to another hospital. And what do you, so what do you think you would say? I used to think, oh, high and mighty, I'm on the receiving end here of these patients. Who are these jerks on the other side? And I realized, oh, no, there's someone just like me. So what would I say to a patient? So what do you think the reason for uh, transfer that was told to the patient? Yeah, we don't have beds. We, we don't have the services. And I always wondered about that discrepancy. Because we all will do, because all of us good boys and girls will do anything to maintain the systems that we're in. And because we, get, we feel uncomfortable saying, not only we're saying I have a concern, but actually doing something about it. And what we do is maintain these systems. Uh, so I'm going to give you a description of two patients. So we did this study and we wrote it down and we, we decided that we had statistics and the findings were 25% of the patients were unstable and about 25% ended up in an intensive care unit and the medical patients had a higher risk of dying than medical patients who came to county directly. And I'm not saying they didn't get great care at county because they did, but that delay, some of these hospitals had the capabilities of taking care of them. Here's one, gunshot to the head, uh, uh, on a ventilator, transfer to county, no insurance. Or this one, this is from my town, uh, Oak Park, Illinois, one of the hospitals. Woman in uh, terminal stages of labor, 10 centimeters dilated, breech delivery, foot in the vagina, transfer to county, no insurance. I'm just saying that when we did this study and afterwards, the, our our OB gynees came to us and thanked us because they had, there were so many maternal deaths uh, because of women being transferred because they didn't have insurance. Think of the, the resident on the phone put, sending someone, a woman, to her death because it made the system work better. 
And uh, uh, this wasn't the only study, but it's actually first time we, we sent it to the only uh, journal we knew where to send it to. Uh, bec uh, it's the New England Journal of Medicine. And uh, it, I got to testify before Congress and EMTALA passed as a result of this or other ones that it's, it's against the law to <laughs> I, thank you. It's barely enough. But what it did is made me realize at that young age, uh, I want to just tell you another thing about change and resistance. So when, they, when, when our folks, our surgeons in our hospital and others heard we were doing this study, they were angry. So why do you think they were angry? It wasn't so much they didn't want to be exposed. They thought, wait a second, we're getting these cases. This is good for our training program. By the way, this is what county is for. This is what we're for. So even when you're in a system like that, we all play the role. Well, the county system is for the poor people, the uninsured. Oh, by the way, they were uh, literally almost all minority patients. I want to say 98% of patients dumped on Cook County Hospital were black or Latino. And, uh, that, uh, but they were mad. In fact, the day uh, we, we decided we want to have a little press conference, we went to the media relations guy and said, I can't work with you. So we, we just stood with a little piece of paper doing our own press conference. In the room next door to us, the hospital held a counter press conference. And the county board president in Cook County called us a bunch of amateur sociologists. Uh, but again, we got law changed, and that was important. But it, 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 it brought the realization how important it is to actually do science and use that science uh, to better the lives of our patients. So this was uh, one. All of the, but you know, it's through the eyes of the patients that you really appreciate what's going on. So you know, county was an eye-opening experience, and I spent 10 years at a safety net hospital called Mount Sinai Health System in Chicago, literally down the road in the middle of a community called Lawndale uh, in Chicago, and when Dora came with me. And over time, her hypertension got worse, her diabetes got worse, and, you know, we really struggled together uh, to say, how do we help her, and how do we, um, you know, help her disease? She had to make decisions about uh, she told me about whether or not she took her medicine or fed her kids. She told me about the neighborhood she lived in uh, that had uh, no grocery stores and the f food and the money she had could only afford junk food for her kids. In a, in a became, I became aware that actually the problem of the gaps, the death gap, was more than just about the call it the three B's, beliefs, uh, behaviors, and biology. There was something more going on here. Uh, and it certainly, you know, I admit to my own implicit bias, uh, biases around uh, race and gender, but this wasn't about implicit bias, why Windor health was failing. Uh, her granddaughter got shot in the alley near her house. Granddaughter, uh, uh, she adopted a, a kid uh, from the street and raised her as her daughter. She had a child and then left Chicago for safety and then came back and was visiting on Easter, was playing in the alley just down the street, and a couple gangbangers were out shooting, and this eight-year-old got killed right in the alley. And then when Dora said, no one can go outside, and kept, uh, uh, you know, kept her family inside. Her grandnephew, her sister uh, was, my, uh, was my patient, her grandson, a uh, day before high school, got shot pushing two girls out of the way of a uh, gunshot. He died. So the, there's actually something, you know, the other stuff that was outside of the realm of medical care that was affecting, uh, affecting Windor's health. So I want to talk now about this idea of structural violence. Some people call it structural racism. You know, uh, the most overt uh, uh, fashion of this that we've seen, mostly just because of video cameras, this is not new. Uh, the NAACP called out police uh, shootings of black people uh, in 1951 uh, in urban areas. Uh, it talked about how uh, NAACP, he said in the South, 
it was lynching and other things, but now it's police, police violence. So police violence is just one manifestation of something called, stru I called structural violence or structural racism. And, uh, you know, it's how are the structures and design of our society actually uh, prevent uh, uh, people or peoples from achieving their, uh, you know, to, to their best ability what they can achieve. It holds them back. Uh, policing is one of them uh, that, that's obvious. Uh, but the big piece that should uh, bother us as uh, healthcare workers is life expectancy. So, it's, you know, it's, it's, one, it's one thing and very bad uh, that we have disproportionate, uh, you know, um, arrest rates and other things like that. But the fact is that in this country, our mortality, where we stand relative to the rest of the world, especially the rest of the developed world in terms of life expectancy, is at the very bottom. And uh, structural violence, the idea that the way we've designed our society, the rules and uh, procedures that allow some people to benefit at the expense of others, uh, and uh, in, in, is at the heart of inequity, actually creates life expectancy gaps. There's a direct link between who lives and who dies and the way we've designed things, we've decided things are going to be. So here's just a fact. Uh, it, that's and talk about a structural piece. There's one point. So there's a uh, from the New York Times. They looked at uh, 25 to 54 year olds. So this is sort of at the heart of life, at the heart of your middle of your life, when we're uh, have the opportunity to be the most productive, to give most to our communities and our families. There's 1.5 million black men missing in the United States, and so the ratio of black. Uh, uh, men to uh, black women uh, is a 0.83. So the, think about it, for every 100 black women in the United States, there are 83 black men. Whereas for, in the white community, it's about 100 to 99. So there's about equal, uh, in, in white communities, 25 to 54, there are about equal numbers of white men to white women. And so you think of all the consequence of having missing black men at the prime of life. And um, in some places, the, if you look at cities greater than 10,000, that ratio is even uh, greater. So the, the biggest ratio uh, gap in the country is there are, uh, for every 100 black women, there are about 63 black men. Anyone want to venture a guess of what location in the United States has that ratio? Ferguson, Missouri, Ferguson, Missouri. But Chicago is, you know, but you go around and it, 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 you can actually do it. And so where are these black men? Uh, so there's about 1.5 million of them. 600,000 are in the jail or prison system. 900,000 are prematurely dead. They've died. Now, being in prison uh, affects mortality as well. Life expectancy uh, of being in prison, that's a whole different story. But they're missing. And what happens to a community when you get this imbalance in gender? You know, and as an epidemiologist, you, have to, you, you count the causes. This is structural. This is structural. This is not natural. This is not natural. This can only occur and think about this, it's not like you get outside, oh, it rained today. No, these are actions. These are actions deliberately taken by others. This is the laws applied, policing techniques applied, hospital and practice uh, policies applied, school policy. These are, uh, these are acts uh, of, uh, these are not passive acts, they're active acts, the, you know, exploitation. Uh, or these sorts of things require force uh, to do it. It's not natural. This is just showing you sort of a, a disparity in ca incarceration rates. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in, but mass incarceration is a public health problem among many other kinds of problems. It turns out that everybody suffers under this because the white incarceration rates in this country are about three times higher than the European rates. Our rates used to be exactly the same as Europe. 
uh, and now they're uh, totally out of control. A lot's been said about this. Um, so here I'm going to give you a couple facts. Arlene Geronimus, American Journal of Public Health a few years ago, looked at uh, poor people and uh, uh, mortality rates. And here is a fact. And, uh, this was looking at premature mortality. Because, you know, if we die, uh, my mother, God bless her, is 92 years old. That's not premature mortality if she dies. When you die in the prime of your life, that's premature. Black men on the uh, Chicago side, side die eight years earlier than U.S. whites. Another fact, another way to look at it. Chance of a 16-year-old black teen on the south side of Chicago living to the age of 65, 50% chance. Okay, why is it? Why is this true? What's the cause of disease or death here? This is where you yell out. No. What? Homicide. Homicide. So I d I've given this talk in modified fashions all around the country, from Utah to New York City, and everyone says the same thing. And yes, homicide is a problem. Violent deaths are a problem. Uh, you know, there are 30,000 firearm deaths in this country a year. That's a problem. But more than uh, uh, half, about 60% of the deaths, of premature deaths, heart disease and cancer. Heart disease and cancer. So a little bit of our implicit bias is we see a young black man on a, on a screen, and we look at the facts, and we think violence. And yet, because it makes sense, right? Heart disease is the most common. Uh, and, and how many, when you, walk, when you drive across Chicago, for the orthopedic group, as I do, from the west, west suburbs across to Rush, you see so many people with canes and walking. And the, the, I'm, you know, the, more, the death is at the tip of this thing, and down below are all the disabilities and things uh, that uh, you guys are so concerned about. But it's, uh, so here's a, uh, we took this to our board of directors of Rush. So this is the L map of Chicago. Now, I guarantee you, every street in the, every city in the United States, every place in the United States has a, a something like this. So if you start at the loop, you can see that 85 uh, is the life expectancy. You take the blue line, three stops past Rush, our hospital, life expectancy is under 69 years old. This is true in every country, in every city, is actually true in some rural areas of the United States. This is not just a black phenomenon, but it is uh, particularly a phenomenon of inner city uh, uh, neighborhoods. And that life expectancy gap of 16 years is greater than the gap of life expectancy from Haiti to the United States. Uh, and we're looking at this, say, well, what more should we do as an academic medical center now to affect that in our city. And I can guarantee you it's not just health care. It's, it's addressing the structural uh, causes for inequity. So I got involved with, uh, uh, I'm going to give you a couple examples of how this plays out, why it's structural in health care, uh, in case you don't uh, believe me here. This is a fr friend of mine who died. This is from the Chicago Magazine called The Deadly Divide, an article on work we did. We, uh, when I got done at Cook County Hospital, I said, if I'm going to stay on and do this, I want to get involved with prevention. And I, I got involved with doing breast cancer screening. We started the first breast cancer screening program at Cook County Hospital. And a few years later, we want to say, well, gosh, how are we doing? We're suddenly providing screening to people, and it should, things should be getting better. And uh, this is my uh, colleague, Steve Whitman. Uh, and we did, uh, decided to do a study, a look at mortality from breast cancer in Chicago, black and white. I just want to remind you that race itself, people self-report their own race. Race is a social construct. It's something that we've invented uh, as a way to, you know, make sense of things in a murky world, right? Uh, but race itself is not a biological construct. It's a social construct, a political construct. And so people self-identify by race. It's not as if you do, you know, precision medicine will tell us where, who, what you really are. And it's not as if under, under any sense of uh, logic that every disease in the world should actually uh, be linked to the gene for melanin, 
right? It makes no sense that you have these disease gaps tied to race, what, you know, self-described race. We decided we'd look at breast cancer mortality over a period of time. And uh, this is what happened. At one point in time, the mortality rates were exactly the same, and then they began to sp uh, split. As white breast cancer mortality dropped very nicely, the black rate did nothing. Uh, we reported this uh, in Chicago, and I actually became a professor of me internal medicine by writing papers on breast cancer disparity as the disparity got worse. Uh, so there's the ir irony of our, of our systems uh, here. And when we published this paper, the response in Chicago was, well, listen, breast cancer is biological. Uh, black women get worse breast cancers because of uh, genetic and biological reasons. They have larger breast cancers. They're more undifferentiated. They tend to be spread at the time of diagnosis, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And this was some of our colleagues at University of Chicago. And we like looked at this graph and say, well, yeah, if it's biological, how come it was equal? How come there was equity before and now there's inequity? How do you explain that one? Uh, and then uh, we showed the mortality gap in the United States as a whole, New York City and Chicago. And again, the gap in Chicago was the worst in the nation. The US was less, and New York City hardly had any gap. And then we pose the question, what happens to black women's genes when they cross the Allegheny Mountains? <laughs> I, I, it's, it's oddly humorous if it wasn't so painful and sad uh, and, out, and outrageous that we've attributed the outcomes to the people and this is an important point, because if the gap, if the deficit is within us, then we have to fix the us. But if the deficit is in the way we've designed things, then we have to fix the system. And guess what? We will look for 100 reasons not to look at the systems that are built around people around this. When we would show this graph to women and say they would cry, because they thought it was their fault. We did a study of uh, black women and white women. My wife was at Northwestern, a breast imager, and I was at, my, my wife was the one who came up with this idea. We're trying to figure out why is this big gap? Why is this big gap? And she was at a, a safety net hospital, breast imager, U of C trained. I said, you know, I'm seeing all these missed breast cancers. They were there last year on the mammogram. And now they're, and the, now I, they come in with a cancer and I look back and they were told their mammogram was normal. It's inequality and quality. Inequality and quality. I'm going to show you a little bit more, a lot more to be said about this, but we've done studies of this in Chicago. We started a task force in Chicago, and we began to get all the hospitals to share their quality data. Not only that, we got law passed to get this statewide, that they share their quality data. And sure enough, the safety nets in some of these hospitals had poor quality. They were missing breast cancers. We found places that were finding two breast cancers per thousand when they should have been finding nine breast cancers per thousand. Women were going home, said your mammogram's normal, and about seven per thousand had a breast cancer. And then when it comes back, it's more undifferentiated and it's bigger. We've actually reduced this gap in Chicago by 35%. We're writing a paper on us. The only city in the country that's had a reduction in the mortality gap between black and white uh, in the last seven or eight years is because we've not focused on race. We focus on the system and quality. And it's inequity and quality, inequality and quality that's driven this. But we've got all kinds of pushback uh, on this uh, initially as, uh, as we did this work. There's something called the amenability gap. You see this in uh, orthopedics. And the amenability gap says as soon as a treatment becomes, a, a disease becomes amenable to treatment, those who have the means get access to it, and those who don't, don't. And because we like to layer things in this country by race and ethnicity, it becomes a racial disparity. And, and so what's, what you're seeing here in this gap is that as soon as breast cancer became amenable, not just to screening, but adjuvant chemotherapy and uh, other advanced treatments, white women benefited from it where black women didn't. So to further make the case we, of structure, we did this map of Chicago. So the, uh, the uh, green areas are the areas 
uh, that are predominantly uh, African American communities with statistically higher mortality rates than the rest of the city. The blue area is an area of where, uh, white community. And then we put the hospitals that have approved American College of Surgeon cancer uh, programs. They've just gone through a certifi quality certification pr uh, process. You have to ask yourself the question, what is it with these you know, people who move to neighborhoods that don't have accredited hospitals? The hospitals have abandoned the neighborhoods. Hospitals abandon the neighborhoods. Hospitals make decisions based on money versus health is a human right around where sh where's the need. This is a fact. So this is structural, right? You couldn't make a map up, but map your own cities. Uh, narrow networks, I can tell you, narrow network came into Chicago, Blue Cross, uh, red line, the south side of Chicago. You look at the south side of Chicago, there's no good hospitals for people on the south side to go to in the Blue Cross network in Chicago. Uh, so, yes, yeah. Yeah, but it's, a, it's so, but this is, this is cancer accreditation, just to put it out. Just think about having a center of excellence. I can tell you the breast imaging centers of excellence aren't near the poor neighborhoods. This is not just about black or white. It's about who's got the money. We've just arranged it in this country that we've exploited black people for so long that we've just sucked the wealth out of those communities. But poor white communities suffer the same things. Uh, so we added up, I didn't do this, my friend added up all the excess deaths in Chicago for black people experience just because they didn't have the same death rate as white people. And no one's celebrating white death rates. 3,200 is front page of the Sun Times. This number nationally is 60,000. Okay, so now I'm going to quickly go through the health care system. What I'm going to say is like implicit bias is important. But, if, but let me see, structural racism, we don't take that on. And we got a long way to go. We got to take on the structural aspects of our nation that actually promote death. Bias is important, but it's not. Uh, uh, it's the structural bias, the structural racism. These are not the old time racism where you have, you know, uh, people with pickaxes and things like that saying you can't eat in my establishment. These are the day to day thousand deaths by a thousand paper cups of design. None of the people who go to work in places that are providing substandard care are going there to say, I'm going to increase racial disparity today. You know, people are actually going to show up to try to do the right thing. What I learned from being in the safety net, I thought if someone like me shows up in the safety net and we just take great care of patients, everything's going to change. Well, things can get better and a little bit better, but if we don't deal actually with the fundamental structure of our health care system and the way we've done things, we're not going to make it better. So scientific racism, I know you heard about this, it's still going on. So draptomania uh, was a mental illness uh, that uh, caused black slaves to want to flee captivity. We've medicalized, we've medicalized uh, our racism. We've radicalized, right? and I'm going to tell you the bottom one, I'm not going to tell you everything down there. The bottom one is personalized medicine, precision medicine. Health disparity is biological and genetic. Well, listen, every disease is biological, but the idea that it, it, there's a relationship between melanin and every disease, I, I think it's to take a social political construct like race and link it to a disease uh, entity is racist inherently, but we can talk about that. Uh, lots of uh, evidence about uh, unequal treatments. Uh, this is from Bob Higgins, who's a cardiac surgeon, cha chair of surgery at uh, Hopkins now, a friend of mine, looked at a uh, cabbage, car coronary artery bypass surgery mortality. And uh, non-white patients have a 33% higher mortality from cabbage. He says demoralizing at worst. But what it is is that the hospitals that serve predominantly black people in this country or minority people or people of color aren't the same quality. And if you're a white person going to that hospital, you're going to have a high mortality. But because of our, the uh, segregation in this country, where white people go generally in this country to hospitals, uh, they get better care. And they get better care because the hospitals themselves are better. Look at the star rating by Medicare and, and the five and four star hospitals serve predominantly white populations in the one and two star 
brown populations. If you end up getting surgery, it's, it's not just the surgeon, it's the support services, it's lots of other things. And this has been shown for many things. This is trauma deaths. So trauma systems are set up with a series of regulations by the state. You have to have all these things. But if you uh, go to a predominantly minority hospital, your trauma mortality is higher. Now we would say, oh gosh, black people die at a higher rate. Must be their genes. And we never say it's the structures that we've imposed on them, including our hospital system. We have a separate and unequal health care system. It's, uh, it's driven by what card you have or don't have, the quality of that card, and because of the, what we've done, uh, how we treat race and ethnicity in this country, it lines up by uh, melanin pigment uh, in, in our country. It doesn't matter what disease you look at. Primary care uh, docs who take care of blacks and whites are different, and most of the Medicare population is taken care of by doctors who look different than those who take care of uh, others. Uh, many diseases, there are disparities. I'm not going to go through any of this. It's just true, but it has nothing to do with, with uh, the uh, race itself. It has to do with racism itself. And uh, until we're willing to confront racism, so here's what we've got to practice the words racism uh, because it exists. And it's, once we realize it's a, like a disease, you, you have to then treat it like a disease. Uh, by calling it out. Um, hypertension control, there are gaps. Not everywhere. In the West, they've sort of figured it out. So equity means this. So we will live in a country right now where what card you have determines the level of care that you get. So if you've got a Cadillac insurance policy, if you, can go, if you have freedom of choice, you can go anywhere, you can get absolutely the best care in the world. And this has nothing to do with race. It has to do with that card you have. But if you don't have that card, if you have greater needs, you're going to get less. So the equity requires us to think about giving more to those who need more and less to those who have more. And our system is actually based on the opposite. Those who have more get more. Uh, and those who have less get less. Well, that just goes against all the principles of, of, of equity. I just want to just point out here is we're, we're in a very risky times. I am a single payer proponent. Uh, I, don't, I thought the and many problems with the Affordable Care Act. But we're an expansion state, and I got to tell you, people getting cards, having insurance is better than having no insurance. You, you don't need to do, we're the only country that does clinical trials on whether having insurance is good or bad. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't get it. But it, say, actually, <coughs> it has an opportunity to reduce racial and ethnic disparity. And this is what happened with the Affordable Care Act. It cut uninsurance rates about Hispanic, blacks, and whites by a third. Now, it started, it started out that the whites were doing better to begin with, so they w went down a third and did even better. Uh, but the, uh, especially where we expanded Medicaid and such, people that have insurance have now access to, to get in. I got to tell you, the Affordable Care Act was imperfect. I'm a single payer fan, like I said, but we cannot allow it just to be rolled back. And we now have to or, or not go back, so we're going to organize within our medical society and stuff, get the voice of the patients who've been benefited from it. Yes, it needs reform. The premiums are too high. There are a lot of gaps in it. Uh, but to just get rid of what we've done uh, would be a shame. I'm, uh, implicit bias, you've heard a lot about it. I don't want to minimize implicit bias. It's a big deal. Uh, and this famous study by Schulman, it, just, it really is a fact that once you get in the door, what you get is determined by people's impressions of you. Uh, I, what I'm positing here is these structural gaps are really uh, are so much bigger than this, but this is an important uh, to do. I, I like this from Katrina. Uh, the top one is, uh, you know, same river, same hurricane, same thing. This says, a uh, young man walks through chest deep flood uh, after looting a grocery store. And down below, these two wonderful, good looking uh, white folks. Two residents wade through chest deep water after finding. <laughs> <laughs> the fact is, our 
Just like we see a young black man on a screen and you hear gunshots in Chicago and everyone thinks violence, we have to actually have a timeout in our brain and understand that when we go into situations with each other, uh, uh, you know, this, these biases uh, exist. I wrote about this uh, academic medicine. Medicine itself is very problematic. There's so few black men in medicine right now. It hasn't gotten better, it's getting worse, and the barriers uh, for, for getting in are just too tough. So I want to talk about, a little bit about sort of Windora, her path. So uh, this year, she had a, a, I'm, got a call, she's in my office. She had a big stroke. I watched her deteriorate. She had a cardiac procedure, she got peripheral artery disease. We are exactly the same age. And uh, my neighborhood is like three miles away from her neighborhood. And here I am, uh, really the picture of health, don't you think? <laughs> no, no. I, but here we are the same age. And she is just melting away. I, there's nothing I can do. It's like a, a, a galloping horse of disease that, I, that can't be managed. And, uh, you know, she, in my mind, it's, this is the impact of structural violence, the stress, the neighborhood stuff, the food. Yeah, she's tried to manage her diet. Yeah, she's tried to walk and exercise. Yeah, there's a personal side to this. But she had a big stroke, came to my office. I ran down. We have a great stroke service, and I did a stroke intervention. And uh, when I asked her, the, I asked her, who drove you here today? Because she was clearly uh, about uh, becoming a aphasic in front of my eyes. She said, da, da, her, her uh, partner's named Daryl, da, 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 Dr. Ansel. The last word she m mentioned was Dr. Ansel. She went to the stroke intervention, the greatest stroke team you, know, you could have, and uh, is uh, aphasic now with a right hemiparesis. And uh, it you know, as a doctor who's witnessed this, and you, you add that up, you know, by the thousands and thousands, until we fix this structure, we're not going to get better. So I'm going to finish here. As you observe, judge, and act, this is actually, uh, Paul Farmer talks about uh, this, but it comes from uh, Catholic uh, theology about what are our obligations. So, you know, our obligations as healthcare workers, as doctors, is actually to preferentially serve the poor, you know, because if we can preferentially serve the poor, uh, you know, the, the wealthy, it turns out in America, if you're wealthy, it doesn't matter where you live, but where you live when you're poor it could make a difference in this country uh, uh, with five years of life expectancy. Neighborhood and place makes a huge difference uh, in, in life expectancy. So we need to preferentially turn our attention to the issues of the poor. So uh, these are the kinds of questions I think we need to ask ourselves about our, ins our own practices, meaning our personal practices, uh, the practices of our, pr our practices, the practice of our institutions, uh, the practices of our collective institutions. What does this decision have to do with the lives of the poor? So if we see a public policy going on, or even a local policy on you know, we're going to have a new uh, thing on that. We're not going to see people unless they pay their co-pays up front at the door. Oh, yeah, that's good business policy. But is that a good moral policy for taking care of the poor? So we have to be able to, I, I always try to say that's the lead. What more can I do personally to uh, eliminate the racism in our neighborhood, jail, school, house, health care uh, facility, city, country? What more can I do? So we can't, you know, there's a, like the personal integrity uh, piece of this in which you have to uh, have honesty and integrity and a lot of times just saying something. Just speak up. It's the hardest thing to do, as I told you in the, cook, in the transfer stuff. Uh, how can I contribute to improve equity in our profession for our patients? How can I advance universal health care as a human right uh, in this uh, country? Take it personally and start now. I'm going to show you a little thing why, inequality, why this issue of inequality needs to be at the heart of what we do. A little bit of a... 
So a final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this became a very famous study, and there's now many more, because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys, and I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs, and with birds, and with chimpanzees, um, with, but with Sarah Brosnan, we started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now, if you give the partner grapes... The, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes, it's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, uh, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us. That's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. She tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. Why did she uh, test she the rock? We'll get to that. <clears throat> So this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. I, I, you know, I show that to say this is embedded in primate behavior, the idea that we, when there's inequality, we reject it. I, I, as I watch this, he asks the question, why did the monkey who was getting the cucumber test the rock? I, I, I don't know because I... I don't converse with monkeys. Uh, but I always say that, but it's what we do. When something must be wrong with my rock, right? We blame ourselves. So I, the whole point of this talk was we have to see, so the, we have to make the invisible visible. It's not that invisible. As a white man who grew up in, in, in upstate New York and ended up in Chicago, and then with my patient, Windora and others, observed the nature of people's lives, what was invisible to many of my friends and colleagues in much of the country became visible to me. But even when I tried to explain it to my colleagues, they couldn't see it. It's our job to move this from people blaming themselves. Yes, there's personal responsibility. I don't want to minimize that. But to blame and say is we have incredibly broken systems that are unjust, and we can do something about it. Across the street from Cook County Hospital, there's a park. It's called Pastor Park. There's a plaque on it, and it says uh, the words, one doesn't, it's from Louis Pasteur, one doesn't ask of one who suffers, what is your country? What is your religion, okay, your race, or your insurance status? One merely says, you suffer. That's enough for me. You belong to me, and I shall help you. That's why I went into medicine and became a doctor. That's why I continue to be optimistic that we're going to get this done right and why we need to redouble our uh, efforts on part of universal health care, health care for all, and, and equity. And that is our prime jobs. Uh, I wrote a book about it. It was mentioned this is coming out in the spring, The Death Gap, How Inequality Kills, and hopefully we'll bring some more attention to this. And that's me and uh, Windora now uh, after her stroke. And I will just take any questions you might have. <laughs>